Welcome to the Unreal Engine 5 beginner tutorial. By following this free course, you will know the fundamentals to create your own game. UE5 is the amazing game engine created by Epic Games. You may know them from games such as Unreal Tournament, Fortnite and other game studios have also used this engine to create big titles such as Rocket League, the Final Fantasy VII Remake, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, Batman, Street Fighter, Yoshi's World and many more. The list just goes on and on. Not only is this a gaming engine, but it's also used to create movie scenes, architectural projects and awesome product shots like you see in the car commercials. Creating your own games is for many people a child's dream coming true. With UE5 you can do this. I created this tutorial to cover all the basics to get you started and actually create a real game. I hope you are as excited as I am. Let me show you the way. Before we start this tutorial I want to tell you that there may be some certain parts of this video that you already know or you have some experience in. You can easily skip these and down below you can see timestamps and then you click on a certain part of the video that you need. But if you are a complete beginner, I would suggest the first time you go over this entire video, learn everything, and later on you just go to the timestamps and rewatch the part of video that you need. Anyway, have fun, good luck, ready, set, go! First things first, we need to install Unreal Engine on our computer. Go to the website unrealengine.com and go to sign in. If you have an Epic Games account, let's say you played Fortnite in the past or some game that you bought from Epic Games, you can sign in with Epic Games. Don't have an account? Sign up here, fill in the form, fill in with your email, Facebook, whatever you like, and create an account. Then, once you have done that, click Download. Now, downloading Unreal Engine, you can choose between a publishing license and a creator's license. Now, as a total beginner, this really doesn't matter. Because if you hit the download now on one of these buttons, you get the exact same engine. And Unreal Engine gives everything completely free at first. Now, is to say, we are going to use a publishing license because we are going to create commercial games. Or this is more for learning or different. You can see the, the marks right here. But for most people, it is a publishing license. And this means it is free to use. Unless you succeed with your product and you pay 5% of your royalty fees. What this means is, if you make $1 million with your game, imagine that if you do, so then you pay 5%, which is $50,000 to start off with. Now, more details are here in the FAQ, or you can bargain for a better licensing option once you reach that $1 million. So, let's be realistic here. For most people, this will be free forever. And if you succeed, I think you'll be gladly paying 5% if you make a million dollars using games and making games. So for the publishing license, you can read through this, read the FAQ right here. Once your product succeeds, hit download now. This will download the Epic Game Launcher on your computer. And when you first launch this, it should look something like this. This can have different screens and different games promoted depending on the time you open this launcher, but it should be similar. So you can just follow along. Make sure you are logged in with your account that you created or already have. And then click Unreal Engine right here. Now these are the different tabs from Unreal Engine. First of all, when you have downloaded Unreal Engine, which we will do in a second, you find the launch button right here and you can go into Unreal Engine. The first screen is a general overview of their community and newest updates you can find right here. I will subscribe to their YouTube channel, just look for Unreal Engine and you will be up to date. Then in the learn section, also pretty important for you maybe, you can find new tutorials or very interesting tutorials that are up to date and you can choose whatever part you will go. More of a level designer, artist, programmer of or a general quick start guide. So pretty important you go through these ones and try making your own games using this new knowledge. Then the marketplace, it is comparable to the Unity Asset Store, but this is the Unreal Engine Marketplace. You can buy assets, projects or features here. And a pretty neat one here is the free section. So when you click free, you can download these products into your own project. Now you can add to cart, but the free section, don't worry, it will be free. You just have to go to the purchasing right here and then you can add it to your project whenever you want. Another quick tip, free for the month. So make sure each month you come back here and you download or you buy this for free and you will have this internity. Because if you miss these, then they're gone forever. So I always come here every month and I purchase them. Now, it's not really purchasing, but you get them for free. So free for the month, very interesting. And also look at these assets right here. 
Then library are your installed engine versions. So when you hit the plus icon, you can install a different version that you would like. For example, if you want to use Unreal Engine 4, for example, again, or one of these other versions, you can then click install, or if you don't want it, hit this remove slot again. Here you can see your projects. If you click on one or right click, you can open them, show them in folder. Here are the vault. So for example, your marketplace assets that you got from Free from the Mount, you can find them back into your library as well. I can here click add to project and then choose a project you want to add that asset to. Very easy to use also. Now, Twinmotion, it's more for for geometrical, it's more for architectural projects. In this tutorial, I will focus on game development. And here, this last tab is UE5, Unreal Engine 5. You can download the version right here. And you can also see the documentation of the new Unreal Engine 5 features or get the sample project. Little warrant for that, it's 100 gigabytes, so it's very big. Make sure you have room for that if you want to try it on. Now, once you installed Unreal Engine 5 through here, are in the library by adding the version here you get this launch ue5 button right here as of now i'm making this tutorial in an early access state but you can also choose once unreal engine comes out then you can have different versions right here or click one of the versions here and hit launch this will start unreal engine from scratch now if i see this is a new version of unreal engine 5 and it's completely different from this video i will put a link in the description down below with a new tutorial all right, you have gone through all these steps. You know how you can find the Epic Games Launcher, the Unreal Engine, what it taps to. Now it's time to launch Unreal Engine 5. When you open Unreal Engine 5, this is the project window that you will see. First of all, there are recent projects, so things that you worked on in the past. You can click and open them right here. Now, game section is right here. You can choose a template that you would like and then hit create once the options are enabled. But first, let's go to what Unreal Engine can do more, as it's more than a game engine. You can use it for film or video productions. You can use it for architecture, building houses, for example, or for the automotive industry. You can create cars or certain products with it. Now, for this tutorial, I will focus here on games. You can choose a blank project, which is clean, empty, with no code, or you can start from an example map right here. For example, if you want to create a first-person shooter, this is also a great one to start up with. You can have a read through here what is used in it. The puzzle one. We will work today with a third-person view because we will create some little platformer game for this and this is the most used as a beginner as well. Now you have a top-down level view game, AR, let's say it's like Pokemon Go. Virtual reality games can be found here. Or you want to create a racing game, you can start from this template, for example. Now, if you want to start completely from scratch, you can go to blank, but like I said, let's create a third person one. Now, the third person one, you start with a, level, with a little level and you have a character you can walk around with. Now, there's a difference in pro programming. We will use Blueprint for this tutorial. It is visual scripting and C++ is a coding language. It's a bit more complicated, a bit more advanced, so we choose Blueprints. You can do a lot with Blueprints and create great games with them. Now, I will choose desktop for this one. I want to make mobile, so desktop for your computer. The quality here, I will choose maximum. I will use starter content because we will use some assets and starter content from Unreal Engine. So make sure you have this one selected. Ray tracing is not needed here in this game section. Now, we will use Lumen for that, so leave this one open. You can choose a map on your computer where you want this installed. I already have this set up, so I leave this as is. And let's give this a fitting name. So for example, UE5 tutorial. And then you simply have to click create and our game will be created. Welcome to Unreal Engine 5. When you first launch Unreal Engine, this is the workspace that you will see and the workspace where you will create your game in. Coming from Unreal Engine 4, you can see they really cleaned up the interface and I think they did a good job doing so. Now, one of the first things that I always like to do starting a new game engine is just play the game that they already created. So hit the play button and then you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard to just walk around in your level or use the WASD keys while your mouse can look around and you can try the first level here. Now, this is pretty neat. Hit escape key to escape in this mode already. Because 
I can click my character and then I can also change the values of the character and later on change this one into my own character or look at the blocks and how they are made and we can replace this with our own assets and build our own world. So a lot is already done for us and we can create on top of this one. So for example when I select my character right here I can look at edit the blueprint now more on this later in the tutorial and I can look how this is made, how far the camera is from my character, I can click on my character, I can change the skeletal mesh for example into a female or back to a male, hit compile to save the changes and then save your level for example after that. Now there are many things here to see and we will cover the most basic and most important ones but just to show you, you can just create your own character and then put it right in here and this is all done for you. Even the gaming logic, this is the blueprints that we set up. For example, to jump, we have our input action jump and then our character jumps or when we release it, it stops jumping. And you can have a look how they created this. We will make some more examples on top of this as well. I close this for now. And now let's have a look around in our viewport. First of all, an important one is the content drawer. When I click on the content drawer, this one opens up. So, in your content folder, we use starter content. You can double click on this one. And then for example, we can look into blueprints. These blueprints are pieces of code or pieces of art are the combination of both. Usually it has a functionality. So, for example, when I have this blueprint ceiling light, I can drag this right into my level. Now it's hidden, so I have to pull it up like this. And now when I hit play, I can see a light coming from there. So this is our blueprint from the starter content. So content drawer, you can also control space to pull this one up and then dock it in the layout, for example. Or when you just hold with your mouse, and you can see when you're inside of this rectangle and you let go, you can just dock it in your screen wherever you want. Or you can snap it to the top, left, right, or bottom once again. Or you can also drag this right here next to for example the details section or you can just drag it once again let go or why it once was and you can also hit x mark here to close that tab and then just go as you need for example if you want more overview to put things inside of your game you want this down and when you need this one a lot you can use it so this one is the organization of the folders with things and code and art that you will going to put inside of your game or that is already inside of your game so a few settings we can go over it quickly now these are all tiles but you can also make a list you can make columns i usually like to work with a list and there are some options that you can go through you can also click the filter right here and for example you say i only want to see static meshes these are the objects that you can drag into your project, for example, just like this. Or when you right click, you can remove it, add a new filter. And for example, you want only the materials. So for example, here, the cobblestone, you can drag it onto the stairs. And you can see this cobblestone right there. Ctrl Z to undo. And this is basically the content browser. You can also add things right here. New blueprint classes, for example, actors that you can put inside of your level. Or you can add feature content. So for example, the content pack, the starting content we already had. Except for the content drawer, there are also many things that we can do inside of our world, starting from Unreal Engine. When I hit the create button, I can have these lights and I can just drag them right in my game. And on the right side, you can see the settings for each object that you can click on. For example, you can here change the color of your light hit OK to apply it, or when I click it, I can delete it. And you can create many shapes to block out your world, for example, just drag it in, cinematics, visual effects, and just have a look at this one. In content, you can open the marketplace that we saw before, or the Quixel Bridge. So you can use the Megascan assets, you can download it and enjoy your project, materials, items, 3D objects, and you can just download them and put them into your game. I will show you later on how to do that. Blueprints, you can open the level blueprint, so you can add some logic to your game. This is the coding part of the tutorial later on. Or you can just create a new blueprint class. For example, a blueprint, when I hit cancel now, this is a blueprint, this light is a blueprint. It can be a door, it can be a pawn, for example. 
can be a character, anything can be a blueprint. And the cinematics, of course, when you, for example, start a game or when you go to the next level, you maybe want to create a neat cinematic that you can apply later on. When you want to save your logic and save your game, you hit the save icon or go to file and then you can save all. So you save all levels and everything or when just here, it's just the level you're working on. You can also create new levels right here and I use mostly default or time of day of this one. In the edit window, you mostly use the editor preferences and the project settings. The editor preferences, for example, right here, you can look here to all the different settings. But the one I use mostly when I start out is the keyboard shortcuts. You can bind these keys to however you would like them, but I use the default ones. And I changed just the viewport navigation to my keyboard because I have a different keyboard than the QWERTY one. And then when I go to the project settings, the project settings has to do with the game and the playability of the game. These are the things that your player will see and the editor preferences how you work in this game engine. So the project settings, for example, you can go to engine and input is an important one because you here have the action mappings. For example, we already saw jump and you can set the key value to spacebar or to anything you would like. If you, for example, want it to have the J for jump, I don't know why I would do that, but you can just click it right there or add new ones or for different PS4, for Steam, Xbox One, for different consoles, you can just put every action you would like in here and you create new action mappings and you can recall them right there. Also, how to move around, how to turn. These are all set up in this project for you. And then there is, of course, more logic. For example, the platforms, let's say you export to a Windows game. Which icon do you want? Which splash or game splash screen do you want, for example? And you can have a basic look into this. One. But as a beginner, more important, look at your input and then have a read through the other ones as you go. But these are the most important ones for this. And then, for example, the plugins. Let's say you want to add the water later in your game. You can enable the water plugin. Let compile and then drag it in your game. So you will go as you need. Then window. Let's say you just mess around. You really screw up. You don't know what to do anymore. You can go to window, load layout, and then use the default editor layout, and it will reset it back for you again. Or if you are nostalgic, you can use the UE4 classic layout. You are still in Unreal Engine 5, but you can use the, the default one of Unreal Engine 4 to begin with. Now, I will load the default editor layout of Unreal Engine 5 once more. Now, tools built and help. I, I rarely come here because I'm more using the other things and the hotkeys and the shortkeys for that one. Another one here, settings. Let's say you experience some lag in Unreal Engine 5. It can be because the engine scalability settings for your computer are too high. So what you can do, you can use auto and then the system tests what settings are best for you. But what I did with my older computer when I first tested out, it was really slow. I set my shading to low and my shadows to low and the other options to medium. And that worked pretty fine. I had some pretty good results and I could try out Unreal Engine 5, for example. So right now I'm on Epic because I'm having a better computer right now, but you can tweak with low or medium. And one also thing you can change is when you go to edit, then project settings, you can type in Lumen. You can disable Lumen. And later on I will show you what Lumen is. And here you go to global tracing. But then again, it's disabling the global illumination system and then you have to rebuild lighting again like you did in Unreal Engine 4, for example. And you have to bake the light again. And with Lumen on, you don't have to. But it's, it changes in lag and in performance, of course. Now, of course, have another look at these settings, but these are the main ones. The platforms is just how you export to different platforms. Now, these settings right here, Right now we are in editing mode because I can edit here in my viewport and I can edit the game like this. Here I can create a landscape. So for example, I can just work and I can add landscape and create it how I want. And foliage, for example, I can add leaves. I can add things that I want in multiple pieces at one time. Foliage is also for later. 
because these are the three main areas you work in as a beginner. Mostly here, back into editing modes. So, here in the world outliner also, when I click something in the world outliner, it is that selected. These are the things that are inside of my level already. You can also select multiple ones, right click, and I move it, for example, to a folder or edit it together or delete it together. And you can also look up for something. For example, this is the name documentation actor. Let's say you forget where it was. You can also type it in here. Click on the name and hit F on your keyboard to go to this. Uh, you're open to an external URL. Of course, this is a documentation for this. But let's say you don't know where you are. You want to go back to your level. Let's say we click on this and hit F on your keyboard. It will find this automatically for you. Also, for example, your character. Let's go really far out. Hit F on my keyboard and I'm back here where I need to be. Now, you also see me navigating around in my viewport. I use the WASD keys for this while I'm holding the right mouse button. This is like a first person game and this way I can just fly around my level or hit F for example. Another one when I hold the ALT button on my keyboard and with my left mouse button I can just pan around. And usually I just pan around with this key and I hold right mouse button and WASD to move around. Also Q to go down and E to go up and this is how I navigate inside of my level. Now, there's different camera speed for this as well. Now it's at 4, but I can also go really fast out and really fast in again. Now, this is too much, so I set it back. And it's really slow. So, 4 is pretty good for me. And you can also scale this up. So, let's if I apply a scale of 3, this will be 12, because 3 times 4 is 12. So, this is how this works. Now, more options right here. You can show the frames per second to see how performant your game is. And the other options you can select as well. Now, it's set to perspective, but you can also look at it from the top. Pretty neat when you need to reallocate some things pretty precisely. Look at it from the left, back, and many different views. I go back to perspective. The scene is lit, but you can also use unlit or different ones here. And I can show here whatever I want to see. Usually I leave this on and with a short key, namely G, I can deselect the things that my player only sees. Or when I hit G again, I can see the things that I as an editor need to see. So I can just, or I can click right here. And in the details, I can tweak these values as I need to. Okay, so this is how you navigate around. Now, let's say I want to edit some of these things. For example, this block right here. When you have select object on, you can just select them so you can work on them in the world outline and in the details. But let's say I want to move these ones around. I need to have this one here. And there are short keys. You can see them. W, E to rotate, R to scale, and W just to move this one, for example. I can use the arrows to just move this one or Ctrl Z to undo an action. So this is pretty self-explanatory. A pretty easy one also is when I select, for example, a character and I want the snapping back on my ground here. It's end on the keyboard, E-N-D, and it snaps back to the ground. For example, you, you don't have to aim like this and don't know where it is, just end. And for some reason, I think it's just colliding right here. I can do Ctrl Z a couple times. Let's do it with this. And Okay, and this one snaps back. So there's some collision maybe coming on right here. I hit G once more here to get rid of this. Now let's say I can also scale my object. I hit F once again to see it better. I can just rotate this around. I can rotate this like this. And I also can use scaling to make things bigger. For example, this stairs. Let's move this one around. By the way, when I hit spacebar, I can change between these modes. Now scaling. I can scale in the y-axis, or in the x, and in the z. And you can see you have a bit of fun with this one. See, pretty self-explanatory. Just have fun with your assets and try this one out. And now you can see, when I move this, it snaps a little bit to certain increments. 
So when I disable this, I can freely put this wherever I want and it's less precise. Okay, so let's say I want my scaling. I can also use this little QPI right here and it scales in all directions at the same time. Or I can enable snapping again right here and I can snap to increments of one, for example. Let's say up. You can see it goes chunky into blocks of one. I can also set it back to how it was before. So get used to these ones as well. And another pretty neat one. Let's say I can also click and delete this one. Let's bring this one out. You can also duplicate certain objects. So for example, when I want to duplicate this piece of my map, I can hold the Alt key and drag it out and see I get a brand new copy. What you can also do when I drag this and I hold the shift key, I follow with my camera. You can also do this. For example, I hold the alt key and then shift. I follow my duplicate as this one. Now these are many shortcuts in one go, but these are the pretty most common ones. So W L S D to move around, Q E to go up and down with this one. Then click your character, for example, alt and pan around, F to focus onto an object. And then just, just with the spacebar are W, E and R to move, rotate and scale within these camera increments. And that's pretty much the basic setup that I use as a beginner, of course, or just as a more experienced developer, how you can tweak certain things inside of your viewport. Let's talk about Lumen. Lumen is one of Unreal Engine's 5 hottest new features. Lumen is Unreal Engine's 5's fully dynamic global illumination system and reflection system. It captures lighting and shadows in real time. The infinite light bounce in real time is very convenient for you as a developer. This means no more baking of light and a beautiful lighting system right off the box. Let's have a look on how this affects our workflow right here into our project. So let's say I disable Lumen. How can I do this? Go to Edit, Project Settings, and under Engine, you go to Rendering, and then you find Global Illumination, and this is set to Lumen. So let's for now set it to None, a Reflection method also to None. Instead of Detail Tracing, you can also use Global Tracing. So this is more of a workflow of Unreal Engine 4. Because now, when you see I move this cube, you can already see this happening. The shadows are not updated right now. So every time I make a move, I need to build the lighting again. So for example here, build, build lighting only. And this takes a while. You can see this really takes time to build status. And this is just when I move two little things. And then it has to build lighting again here. And now my lighting should be fixed or my shadows. See, right now it is fixed. So imagine if I have to do this the entire time. This is why global illumination is so important because you lose a lot of time if you don't. So back to Lumen. Let's set it back to Lumen. Lumen, Lumen. And here detail tracing once more. So if I restart this project, then you can see when I now move things. And I show you things that I haven't moved before. You can see the lighting and the shadows are corrected immediately. For example, here also. See? This is Lumen. And this saves so much time and you have great lighting right off the box. So very interesting. If you can run Lumen on your hardware, please use Lumen. <laughs> we can talk about Lumen without covering Nanite as well. Nanite is a new geometry system which uses new technology to render pixel scale detail and high object counts. It intelligently works only on the detail that can be perceived and no more. Nanite's data format also supports streaming with automatic level of detail. We call these LODs later on. For you as a developer, this means no more counting of poly counts, vertices, memory count, or making different LODs in different 3D programs. You create the art and Unreal Engine 5 does the rest, without the loss of quality, and all of that thanks to Nanite. Let's see how we can use this inside of our project. Now, to show you Nanite, we need to import some content. So go to Content, Quixel Bridge, and make sure you are signed in to Quixel Bridge right here on top of this. 
And then we can find some assets that we would like to download. For example, let's look for a cliff or some big object that we can use. And let's say I like this one. Now, how we download this? You can have the quality that is suggested, but we can also have Nanite right here to show you this and download it. And this will download it to your computer. Now, a big warning before you use this is this Nanite on big objects can take a lot of hard disk space on your computer, so make sure you have the room for that. And then you have to click add to add this to your current project and you can add this to all kinds of different projects. Now, into your content drawer, and I will dock this in my layout for now, you can see that the Megascans folder, because Megascans is from Crystal Bridge right here, has created a folder where you can find that asset in. And right now, here, it takes a while to compile and to see the thumbnail right here. But this is the static mesh that you just downloaded, the 3D object. And you can just drag this right into your game engine. This can take a while to compile, but once it is compiled, you can play this inside of your level right here and then let go. Let's, for example, just delete these borders right here. And then you can scale it as you please. So you can make it even bigger or wider for example like this just move it around and you can also alt drag create a duplicate of this one and then rotate it a bit and my level right now is more coming alive like this so now when i hit the play button you can see this is a sandstone cliff with high detail i think it looks really great so now how can i see if this is nanite you can go to lit and instead of lit, you choose nanite visualization and then triangles. And you can see the triangles that make up my model right here. Now, when I zoom out, you can see these triangles are changing. And when these triangles are changing, my LEDs are changing automatically. And now when I zoom in, the pixels are updated, so I have more detail when I come closer. And when I go farther, I have less detail. And this is all calculated for me in Unreal Engine. And this is the power of Nanite. Even with a terrible computer, it does this for me, so my computer can play this. Just, it takes a lot of space on your computer sometimes, but it depends on your project and the models that you have right there. So this is an asset from the Megascans library, from here, Quixel Bridge. These are photorealistic scans, and they are very beautiful. You can create a great level with this. And when you are inside of Unreal, you have the license to use this in a commercial game as well. Now, how can you do this with your own assets? You go to content. Let's create a new folder for this one. Uh, let's name this car, because I have a car ready on my computer. And let's hit import, find your file. And here you can disable or enable Nanite. And now I will enable Nanite for this one. And then I hit import and let it compile for a while. You can ignore these errors for now. And then you can drag this inside of your game. Let's scale it up a bit. If I now hit play, this is inside of my level. Now, it's not fully colorized right yet because the shaders are compiling right here. But just to show you this example, also here, when I go to Nanite Visualization, Triangles, you can see this is also calculated inside of Nanite. Once again, all the benefits onto my static mesh here as well. So, instead of Triangles, go back to Lit right here. Let's say I will delete this car. And then force lead to completely remove it. And now let's import this car once more. But this time I will not use Nanite. And I choose import. And I then put it into my game. Scale it up a bit so you can see it better. And now when I go to Nanite. Triangles. You can see there is no Nanite bin built onto this. Now for one object this could be fine. But if you have many game objects. This can cause some memory issues, so your game will be less performant. So, whenever you can use Nanite and mostly on static objects, like a cliff or a car that is not driving with you in it, then you can use Nanite. It's a great system to reduce the amount of work that you have with different LODs and to stream for better quality as well. Okay guys, in this part of the tutorial I will show you how we can work with materials. Materials are assets that you can drag onto your static meshes and it defines the look and feel of your object. 
So for example, you can look at it as a paint or a certain texture and it's more than that, but that's basically what it comes down to. I went ahead and created a new level so I can show you materials on this object. I went to file, new level, and I chose time of day, delete the things that I didn't need. So also here in the content browser, I will right click, create a new folder and name this one materials. Open this one up. To create a material, you can go to add or here, right click, material. And let's name this basic material or basic M. And now when I double click, you get this view of the material editor. Now what I like to do is just jog this off and place it right here so I can switch more easily. So to create a material, we are in this material editor. Here is how our material looks right now. These are some other options that you can have. And this is the palette where you can choose different nodes to put in your material graph. And with here, holding the right mouse button, you can pan around. With the left mouse button, you can select and drag. And with your scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out to work with this. So here in this space, we will work with materials. By the way, this palette you can also call upon when you right click once and you can also get this one right here. So when we go over these settings, we see the changes applied here and later on we can drag that material onto our object right here. Okay, cool. So the basic thing that we can do is change the color, but to change the color, we need a constant tree vector. So right click and type in constant. And you can see constant tree vector. Because the color has three factors of the RGB values, red, green, and blue, if you know some bit of about colors. But it's pretty easy. You can just drag whichever color you would like, for example, something more red. But right now you see this is still black. That is because I have to drag this value up also to go from the darkest value of that color to the brightest. So usually when you want the color that you picked, you drag this up to here and then you hit OK. What you now can do is connect this pin with your left mouse button and hold and put it into base color right here. And right now you can see the changes are applied right here. Very easily to do. Now, what you can also do is hold control and drag the pin somewhere else. Or if you made some errors, you can hold the alt button and click to detach these. So now what we can do is drag this in here. And what we have to do is apply these changes or like in other blueprint settings we have to compile so here it is apply you can save your changes if you would like to and now it's very easy just drag it onto your object and right now I hit F to focus and I hit alt button so I can look around our color our material is applied to this object now you can also apply this to this logo if you would like to but I control Z to undo that one so standard, when I click here on my basic mesh, you can see the static mesh. When this slot is empty, so I can reset this value, clicking this button right here, it has the standard Unreal Engine material applied on this. You can also drag this one in this slot right here, element zero and element one is the logo that I just showed you. Now you can easily change these values, double click on this to open it up once more, and let's give it more of a blue. Right now nothing happened, that's because I have to go to apply. And right now it happened. So this is how you do it. Let's give more of this one. Now there are some more things that you can do. This is a constant tree vector because for our color we need three vectors. We can also use a constant one vector to put into metallic and into the roughness. Metallic is to make an object out of metal. Right click and hit constant. By the way, a short kick, if you hit one on your keyboard and then you click, you get a vector one. And if you hold three on your keyboard and then you click, you get a vector three input node. So let's connect this up to a metallic. Right now we see no differences because the value of metallic is zero. And you can change the values between zero and one. Zero is zero metal. so then you can delete it actually because it has no value. And usually an object is or entirely not metallic or completely metallic. So let's put one 
hit enter and now this is more of a metal one we can also choose this for the roughness so right click add another constant one vector and plug this into roughness also roughness at zero there is no roughness so right now we basically have a mirror when i apply these changes you can see it's basically a metal mirror but when i choose this value as one it's all rough there is nothing shiny anymore so for metallic objects is not more realistic so you can also choose a value in between like let's say 0.2 for example and i now hit apply we get something more realistic of this so we have a more shiny object that is made of metal and then you can also tweak these values as you like but metal is either zero or one let's create another material for our logo so let's say we wanted a neon light so it's really close so right click go to material and let's name this neon underscore m for neon light effect now i name this underscore m to really quickly see that this is about the material some people also put m underscore in the front to really see it quickly this is however you prefer your naming conventions so double click to open that one up and this time we're going to change how we put our notes in but this is the time we need the emissive color and a multiply note so to have a color of course we're going to have the constant three vector once more and choose the color that we would like let's give it something greeny drag this value up and we are going to use a multiply node so you can right click and type in multiply or hit the m key on your keyboard and while holding it click to get a multiply node and we are going to get a constant one node just a constant node to change the criteria for how much this color needs to be multiplied into a missive color right now it's set to zero but let's say this is one and drag the multiply into a missive now you can see it is a bit more glowy but we can multiply this multiple times let's say i give this a value of five you will really see the glow more and more coming out or i can really exaggerate to show this effect more taking place you can see 20 times or even 100 times if you would like it like that really see the glow here so i can drag this one onto material or here in the slot and right now you can really see the glow coming alive right here on my object but it's a bit too much now instead of always coming here and changing the materials we can make a material instance so this is a master material right here but we create an instance so we can quickly tweak values just like this one how do we do that we change our nodes here to parameters and you can change anything to a parameter a color our constant one vector and many more things how do you do that right click and then convert to parameter you can give this a name for example color and you can also do this here right click convert to parameter and let's give this a name let's say the value hit apply now because we have parameters now i can go here and then right click and create a material instance it already named this instance for me and instead of this material i will drag this instance onto the logo now double click to open up this instance and now i can change the value so let's set it back to five for example and you can already see the changes taking place Or you can also use a decimal number if this is too much for you like 0.2 for example or 0 0.001 and it's a bit emissive you can play with these values how much you would like let's put this back to one just for tutorial purposes not going for any awards right here just showing you how you can work with the parameters and when you tick the box of color you can also change the color something more bluey for example and the colors should take instantly taking into change control s to save it 
and then you can see the colors are applied right here. So this is how you can work with multiply nodes and emissive colors and create instances and drag these instances on your slot so you can change these values live as you go. Now you don't have to always ping between here because you can also enable disable, quickly see the changes applied here in real time or cancel if you just leave it as is. Now, there is one more node that I really want to show and that's a linear interpolate node. So right click and then go to material and they call it a lerp mostly. So let's have a look at that one. What we can do is blend in between colors through a certain alpha value. Let me show you what I mean with this. So let's get two constant three vectors to get two colors. By the way, I can use Ctrl W to duplicate in Unreal Engine. And let's give this a color of blue. And let's give this a color of yellow. And now what you can do, right click and look for linear interpolate. You can click this one or hold L and click. Now these are a lot of short keys, but these will make your life a bit easier. And what I can do now, when I drag this in A and this in B, and I put this one in the base color, I get the combination of these colors. So blue and yellow should be a green output. And this is a green output. Make sure you hit apply and then you can drag this color onto here. Now you can say, what's the point? Why can I make this color in the first place? Now let me show you the beauty of a lerp. Now go to your content draw. In content, we had a start of content. And then there are textures. And we can linear interpolate through one of these colors. And this is the one that I want to show you. So, for example, when I double click on this one, I can switch between the yellow and the blue, like this one here. Now, color is made of red, green and blue channel. So, the red channel only has these values. The green one is set up like this, and the blue one like this. And together, they make up this texture. Now, why is this handy? Let me show you. So, in the content drawer, let me drag this one right here and it creates a texture sample. And I can sample my texture through the alpha. So, if I take all the three channels, I will get a pattern like this into the alpha. Because the alpha is blending between these colors through this one. And when I now hit apply... Now, isn't this pretty? I do think so. But let me show you what I showed you before. If I want a pattern like this, I only need the red channel. So I can drag my red, my R, my red, and then it will change like this. Or I can switch the blue and the yellow. By the way, don't cross wires if you don't have to, so I can switch these. So I will fix it again. Or when I look at the green channel, it will get a pattern just like this. So grab the green channel into alpha. And it looks more like this. I hold with my left mouse button, by the way, to look around. You can also see how it looks on a cube, how it looks on a static mesh, or more on a sphere kind, but I like the ball the best. And also the blue channel. You can see it's more like a beach ball now, because when I go to blue, it's more a pattern just like this. Or I can use the RGB, whatever you prefer, and then you hit apply. And then my material is also updated. So this is how you can use lerps and texture sample maps into this node to create and blend between material colors or materials. We created materials from scratch or materials using colors, but you can also use textures. And let me show you, let's create a field of pebbles right here on this plane. So right click, it's again a material, and let's name this material pebbles. First, to show you how normal maps and roughness maps work, I'm going to start with a color, but we will use texture maps to texture this one. So, this time I'm using my palette, but you can also right-click. Let's start off with the color. Let's give it something like green, for example. Now, once more, don't forget to use apply, because that's the main reason why this won't work. Now, this is just green everywhere, but you can decide where there is more roughness, or where are there more shadows, which are normal maps. So, 
let's me use the content browser for that into content we go into starter content back into textures and let's say we want to use this for example as our roughness i can plug this one into roughness and when i hit apply now let's look what happened some spots are more rough than other spots because we use the texture to determine where it is rough and where it isn't rough or we can use normal maps to see where our shadows should go for example this is a normal map they usually look bluish so something like this and when i plug this into the normal and i hit apply There is more shadow on certain parts than others, but right now it's not really visible because I have a color here. So I'm going to delete this and let's look for our pebble materials. Pebble. So you have a color, you have a normal map and a roughness. Let's drag this in. And let's organize them. So when I plug this into my base color, and hit apply now my floor here is covered with pebbles but it's already pretty nice but it can be better we can add more detail and roughness in it so if we use this one for our roughness and then hit apply you can already see this coming more alive and especially if we also had more shadow to this which is the normal maps basically and then we hit apply you really see the difference and it's it's looking more like a shadowy and really like pebbles because it gives the impression of shadows onto a 2d object looking from here so it looks more 3d right now now one more thing i want to show you are texture coordinates because right now the pebbles are like this but i can make them bigger or smaller and we do that with a texture coordinate and this texture coordinate goes into the uvs they decide the U and the V values, which make it bigger or smaller. First, we're going to use a multiply node for this, M click. And also a constant to tweak how big or how small we want this. Let's set this one as value 1, which is the default value, which will change nothing as of now. So when I now hit apply, this decides how big these textures are going to be. I plug this into the UVs, but right now it's set to 1, so it's keeping its main value. Nothing changed right now. But let's say if I put this at 0.1, so 0 0.1, it's a tenth. And let's look now what happened. These are 10 times bigger now. Free need, right? Or we can go the other way. Let's make it 2 times more pebbles. Hit apply. And you see, we have way more detail. And you can play with these values how you like. We can make them half big. And then you can play like this. So remember, the main color, go into the base color, the texture map for the roughness in the roughness, and the normal maps in the normal maps. These decide how rough or yeah, how <laughs> not rough a certain spot is. And the normal maps decide more where the shadows go and into normal. Then we had a texture coordinate to decide how multiple times this should be multiplied in the UMV directions. So I multiply these all in the same UV input at the same time. And then I can tweak these values. And once again, you can convert this to parameters. You can also then apply and then create a material instance for this. And then in the material instance, where you enable the parameter, you can see it changing. And maybe you can decide better whatever you would like. So let's say you want a material instance, and then you can drag the instance on top of this. So this is basically how to work with materials. We showed a lot, but with these tips as a beginner, you can make pretty much any material or use any texture you find online or create yourself. In this part of the tutorial, you will learn how to create and edit landscapes. Before we do that, I hit G on my keyboard, here in my view, 
and this is to hide certain elements, I don't need them, these can only be in my way, and I click and delete these objects. Now we have always been into editing mode and we can go clicking here on landscape mode or shift 2 to go faster and these are settings to create a new landscape under manage. Now here creating new, these are some settings that you can change. We will create landscape materials later on. These settings are fine for me and these are how big your landscape is going to be. I like to change my camera speed to something like 5 of 6 when working with landscapes so I can fly faster over a big piece of terrain. Set it back to 4 when you're done creating your landscape. Now something I want to show you is the landscape technical guides. Look for this one in Google or just type this URL in and then you will look down for recommended landscape sizes. These sizes are numbers that maximize while minimizing the number of landscape components. So you get better performance. These ones are for bigger landscapes and these ones are for smaller. Now as a beginner I recommend going with one of these to start out with. These are also pretty big if you're creating a game on your own. So these make up the quads, the sections, components and the total components. So when you go here in Unreal you can again see the components, the number of components, the resolution, the quads. So have a look at the optimal settings for creating landscapes. Now just for tutorial sake I will just hit create and I create my landscape. Now I'm into sculpt mode and right here it is set to sculpt. Now look what happens when I left click with my mouse and I drag around. You can see there are parts coming alive on my map. I am sculpting pieces of landscape. You can create mountains or other parts of your world. Now, when you hold down shift key and then you click on your mouse, you can see you go in the opposite direction. And this way you can also create holes in the ground or holes into your mesh uh, in your landscape. Now, you have different brush types. So you can see you get different effects. So I like to use the round one with this brush fall off. Now, Ctrl Z to undo certain things. Now, the tool strength, when it's up in one, it goes up really quickly and when it's more close to zero it's more smooth so you have to do more strokes while holding the left mouse button usually I use something like this and then shift click to do the opposite effect now the brush size you can see you can edit big pieces of landscape in one go or make it really tiny to just edit certain parts. You can also change the fall off. And then you can also use the smooth one right here. So you can see I used shift and then left click to undo a certain action, but you can also smooth it out. So when I increase my tool strength and my brush size, you can also type it in a value or when you hit this arrow, it resets back to the default one. You can see this smoothens it out. I will increase the brush. See, it is all smooth. And also a useful one is flatten. I will decrease the brush size one more, or I can hit these angles right there. You can create flat pieces. So, for example, when you sculpt a certain area, and then you can use the flatten one, it creates a flat area right here. So it can be pretty neat and handy to use that one. A ramp also, you can click for the beginning and the end point. You can also drag it around and then you can add a ramp and then you can sculpt once more. So that's how you can create ramps as well. Another one, erosion. It creates an erosion field. So hold your left mouse button and then you can go like this. You can increase the brush size or decrease it. And also here the tool strength. Let's give it up to one. Now this can be used to create more like rivers and creeks for example. And create an erosion just like this. Now not going for any awards here. Another one can be, now these I use less, but for example the mirror. So everything that is from here can be mirrored to the opposite side. Or you can just 
plug it around. And now when I hit apply, the left side and the right side are equally. And this is handy when you create a certain map and you need to have the boat mirrored. Like for example, a first person shooter game or a multiplier shooter game that has to be equally mirrored. There are still many ways to edit your landscape. You can even manage the certain elements of your landscape. For example, you can add new components, for example, on the edge here, or you can delete them. You can move them around or select certain parts once more and then go back into sculpting as you please. Okay guys, now I'm going to show you how you can create landscape materials. It's a bit different from our previous materials and then how you can paint landscape. I already went ahead and created a landscape just like this, but you can create any of your own, any is fine. Now, when you go to paint to paint a landscape, this won't really work because we have to create our material first to paint it. I created this landscape, by the way, just sculpting, increasing the tool straight and brush size as I needed. Just sculpt these ones as you see right here. Then I used flatten to create a flat area where my player starts. And finally, I smoothed the rough edges out. Now, how we can go about painting. Let's go back here into editing mode. Bring out the content drawer. I will dock this in first. Go to content and let's create a folder for this one. Right click new folder. Let's call this landscape. Open that one up. Right click and create material. For example, uh, M underscore and then landscape. So I can create a landscape material. I will dock this right next to this one. Okay, landscape materials are a bit different. Because when you right click here, you look for landscape layer blend. And this little note changes everything. We are going to do some basic setup first. And the rest is pretty much like the other materials. First of all, right here, this note, we click on this. And then we look for, type in attributes. And then we can see use material attributes. Because what we are going to do is connect the layer blend of the landscape materials into this node. Can ignore this for now. So click on the layer blend. Hit this icon right here once again, so we can enable this one. And then we're going to add three layers, grass, some dirt and some rock. So one, two, three layers. The first one here, name it grass. The second one is going to be dirt. And the third one, let's call this one rock. Now you can see, you create grass, dirt, rock, and these attributes will be split to there. So now let's create a pin from here. Let's look for material attributes and then make material attributes. And we see something pretty similar like how we started. So when I look for the attributes once more, you can see it is pretty similar to this one because now I can make material attributes for grass, a separate one from dirt and a separate one from rock. And then it goes into this node that I started with. So I'm going to need two more of this. So I scroll out a bit, control W to duplicate. Once more, control W. Let's align these a bit more. Okay. The second one here plugs into dirt because I'm going to do dirt by double clicking so I can rewire a bit so it's more neat and organized. And this one goes into the rock. Okay, cool. We have our setup now for our landscape material. What we are going to do is create textures for the grass, dirt and rock. Now in the content drawer, I'm going to dock this one in the layout for now. And we go into content and then filter to textures. These are the, the textures from our start content. So this is why we use starter content, but you can also find textures online. The first one is grass and this one. And this one we will need. The first one is the base color. So RGB into base color. And the second one is the normal map. Usually it's so bluish, purplish. This is the normal map. Now, we don't really have something named dirt, but we can find gravel in the starter content. We will use the gravel for our dirt here. So drag these and plug the first one into the base color. 
and the second one is the normal map. Find normal and plug RGB into the normal. And then we finally had our rock layer. So there are different kinds of rock. Let's go with basalt. You can also shift click or control click to bring in both at the same time. So this one is for the normal map. This one is from the base color. And I will close the content browser for now. Okay, we are coming pretty nicely along right now. Okay, great. So one thing I also like to add is to change the roughness. For that, we're going to use a constant. So in my palette, you can find a constant, drag that one in, then right click, change this, convert to a parameter. And let's name this one grass roughness. A parameter because we're going to make material attributes. This is our master material for our landscape. Then Ctrl W to duplicate this one. And we make one for the dirt as well. Now we can also rename this one. So instead of grass, we can name this one to dirt roughness, plug it into roughness, Ctrl W once more. And this one goes into our rock roughness. So once more, change the name into rock roughness. So we have three parameters. What we're also going to do is to create texture coordinates like we saw before. So we can also change how big or small our grass, dirt and rock is going to be. Right click, create a texture coordinate and find the texture coordinate. Okay, great. We use our multiply node, M click, and we are going to use another constant. That constant, we will convert to a parameter. So let's say grass coordinate. And then we plug this one into A, this one into B, and this one in the UV of the base color and the UV of the normal map. So both of these scale in the same way from our coordinates. We can copy and paste this one, Ctrl C, Ctrl V, or Ctrl W to do it in once. Do the same here for the dirt. I will change this name to the dirt coordinate. Once more, duplicate. So we can also use this for our rock. Once more, also change the name here to the rock coordinate. So later on, we can easily see what is this. Once again, hit apply. Now, this is a lot to take in at first. I know when I first learned this, I was pretty amazed about how all of this works. But let me go one time through this. We started out with our material attributes, but we connect this up with our layer blend. Because then, we can use the make material attributes for the grass, dirt, and the rock separately. So, for the color and for the normal map, these are mostly the shadows, I drag in my grass textures and the roughness, I use the parameter because I can change the value 0 to 1. I did the same for the dirt. These are the dirt textures for my starter content and these ones are the rock and then finally, I added a texture coordinate with the multiplier with the parameter right here. Because then, later on, I can scale how big or small I want these textures to be. Same for the dirt textures and same for the rock textures. Apply, save. And now when I go back to my map, make sure you're in editing mode. I select my landscape. Can also drag this up a bit. And then you look for the material slot. This is the landscape material. Before we do that, we're going to right click and create material instance. Enter. Because the instance I can, when I double click this, I can change this one. And then I'm going to drag this one in the landscape. And it always already highlights this. And now this will compile shaders and it will look like an error at first. See, this is normal. 
Now, when I go back to the landscape mode and I go to paint, you can see my three layers right here, the grass, the dirt and the rock. What you're going to do first is create layer info, hit the plus icon and then choose weight blended layer normal. Hit save. Now, this might take a while to compile, but let it compile. Then I do the same for the dirt layer and I do the same for the rock layer. And now I can use these layers to paint onto my landscape. The grass is already applied. You can click dirt and make a dirt road or rock and just create rock on top of these mountains for example. But let's fix some things because right now this looks like a plastic world. It's way too shiny and there is too much repetition. We create a material instance and that's pretty handy because right now I can just tweak these values and make my landscape as I want to. So let's first go over the roughness. Now, zero is all shiny. This is why our world is so shiny. And one is all rough, like no shininess at all. So dirt, let's say a zero of 0 0.9, because that's very rough. Grass maybe a little bit less. And rock, let's also set it at 0 0.9. Then for the texture coordinate, let's start at one. Because that's the default value of our texture. Just one is the default for the coordinates. And the roughness is valued between 0 and 1. So right now, click save. And our material already looks way better. It's not made of plastic anymore. So now you can zoom in. And I will change the camera speed for this one to something like 2. Because I really can go more smoothly. And you can see this is way better. This is better grass. But when I zoom out, you can already see the tiling happening right here. See, this is way too much. Because then I can change my coordinates. So for grass coordinates, let's change this to something like 0.2, for example. Hit save once more. And see, this is already way, way better. I can tweak these values in the opposite direction as well. Hit save. But this is styling too much. So let's go with the value of 0 0.1. And I also do this for the other coordinates. And rock coordinate here as well. Okay, I think I like this for now. Now um, let's go back here to paint. Let's go with the content browser. Because now when I hit dirt, let's set the tool string to 1. So I have all dirt, brush size, increase a bit like this. And now when I paint, I can paint a dirt route all the way up to this mountain, for example, like this. And then I can click the rock and increase the brush size and create rock just like that. So, for example, this is all a rock now. And once more, this is styling a bunch, but when I zoom in, you don't really see this because my player won't be this high on my surface. One other tip that I can show you so you don't really have to guess your numbers. So you go above where your player should go in that view. You see a tiling now. But drag off this landscape instance. Make it a bit smaller. But make sure you see your text and your values here. And now you can see we are here on the rock. You can drag these values and then see it changing. You can also drag it to the left and see it changing as if you are your player. And now you can also reset it back to the original. But because you are dragging this, you can choose a value that you like. So I think I like something like this looks pretty cool. And then you can find your ideal coordinates way better and then hit save if you are happy with the rock as this is. And when you are done placing your grass, making your roads and making your rock, the fun part starts and that is dragging your player in. So go to create and now go to all classes and type in player start or just find it here. Drag it here into the spot. Make sure you are back into editing mode. Drag up the gizmo, hit the end key once more to snap it back to the ground. Where do you want your player to start? Let's say something more like here. And now I can also change this level and hit play. And now I can walk my road that I created. 
I can look at the grass. You see, you don't really see the tiling now from this view. And there is the rock. Now, of course, um, I stopped there because this is for tutorials, but you can make it really nice and really blend between these materials. And then go up your rock, discover your world and play in the grass. Now I want to show you the integration of Quixel Mega Skins from the Quixel Bridge. Go to Content and then find Quixel Bridge, open it up and make sure you are logged in. Now we already showed this in the earlier part of this tutorial as well, but now we go more into depth. Now here at home you can find any asset, any material and also landscape materials you can drag into slots and assets you can find here as well. You can create beautiful levels just like this one. So let's say we look for something like snow. You find a snow type that you would like and you can just download it and then hit add to add this to your project. Okay. And then find other assets as well that you would like to create your level. For example, I like this one. Make sure you download it and add it to your project like I showed you before. Now, here in Content Drawer, in Content, then Mega Scans, you under Surfaces, you find this snow. And this is a material instance. So when I double click this, you can already see the different parameters that they created for me from Mega Scans. I now see global settings, the tiling, and the offset. So let me give you an example. Right now, in Details, when I click on my landscape, I have my landscape selected. You see here, when I select my snow, I can click this use button and now there is all snow on my landscape. And you can already see the tiling happening a lot. We can also fix this for mega scan assets because now I can drag this off. Same like before, make it a bit smaller, but make sure we see this text as well. Hit the tiling, enable the tiling. And now let's set this for example, you can drag this to see how the material changes. And you can see this happening in the level. Let's go with the tiling of 0 0.01 everywhere. And you see that this is already way better of a snow landscape then let's say if i toggle this off this is styling and i can already change these mega scan assets as well for my liking so i can also tweak these values but for me only the tiling was the problem and then you can have more of a snow landscape just in a quick fix and already also i downloaded this ice cliff so into the content browser. This is not a surface, but back in Megascans, it are 3D assets. And I can drag this one in. We can also show this around. Remember, I'm using these ones with hotkeys W, E, and R. R to scale. Let's make this one bigger as well. Now, these are photorealistic assets. You can just drag and play with them around can also disable snapping to make this more smooth. Maybe more like this. And also put it a little bit in the ground as well. And I can hit Alt and drag this one out. And the trick is to make these of different scale sizes. Maybe rotate this a bit more. And then I'll drag this one also. And this looks like a complete new cliff here. So now when I hit the play button, you can see these photorealistic scans here coming alive. I changed my world into a snowy landscape. I have photorealistic assets and now you can really play along and create a level that you would like. You can see it is already pretty neat. And I just dragged in two assets and a landscape that I created before and already have some pretty cool worlds of my own. We went over the editing mode, the landscape mode, but another one important is the foliage mode. 
Now, foliage is, for example, when you want to place a bunch of ferns, tropical plants or leaves, for example, and you don't want to drag them one by one. This can be faster. First of all, we need foliage. So back again, content quixel bridge. I already downloaded, I looked for fern and I downloaded this fern, for example, the common fern. And I also looked for palm for some yeah, tropical palm as foliage. And I added, I downloaded and added them to my project. Now, when you go to your content drawer in your Megascans folder, it created a plants folder. So these are the ferns, but you can see the different texture, the static mesh for this and the materials and the material instances, but also map foliage. So Unreal can detect what foliage to put in. And it is also for the tropical plant and the fern. So now when I go to the foliage tool, you can drop your foliage in. So for example, when you dock this, it is easier to dock it to the right side instead of having it below. So you can drag it in. Or it is smart enough to recognize this as foliage. So I click on foliage and I can enable the foliage that I would like. For example, a fern and a tropical plant. These are deselected by default, but when you select them, then you can paint them on side of your level. So have them selected and then click paint. Now you have your brush size here. You can increase it to have a bigger size. Let's say something like this. And the density is how much of something you would like. So let's place some foliage right here. When I click now, you can see this is painted inside of my landscape. When I increase the density, you can see there are more here than there are here. I usually leave this as is. Now, if you want to delete them, you can have erase density, but I like to hold shift and then click. This is much easier and faster for me. This is a short key for removing them. You can also have this one clicked and also this one. So this is a combination of both of them. So now when I hit play, you can see the ferns and the palm trees together. Once again, shift click to remove this. I deselect this one because right here you can change also the density and the settings of this specific one. So for example, we want this to have a density of 100, which is standard and the radius, how far they are from each other. We can also enter some numbers right here, how small they should be. One is the default. So let's say I have this boat at one, then each and every vern will be the same size. Now, this is not natural because in nature, they are also different from size. Let's really exaggerate this between one and 10. And then you can really see there are some really big ones and some small ones in between. So you can see the small ones and the very big ones. Now, this is too much of a difference. So let's pick this one between one and two times its size. Now, maybe 0 0.9 to make one smaller a bit. And now you can see these have different sizes. This one is a bit bigger than its neighbor right here. And so we can edit with the size of the foliage. So we don't have to do that individually. Then some other settings, for example, the random yaw, because if I don't do this, they are all turned in the same direction. Now they are turned to different directions and in different sizes. I can then also tweak the values of this palm, for example. Let's say I don't want density of 100. Let's set it to 25, for example. Let's delete this one with shift click and Let's also change the brush size. And now you can see we have some palm trees with some ferns in between. We have been into paint the entire time, but you can also click select. So you can select individual ones. For example, I want this one because when I have select, I can also move this. I can rotate this however I would like or scale this one up. So if one thing is out of place or you want to create some different things, you can have it just like this. Also, you can use single. I have both selected, those won't work, but I can also click for single ones. 
For example, when you want to add trees or something in very specific parts, you can do it just like this. So mostly you're being in paint mode, but I want to show you that these ones are also possible. By the way, it is also good to know that any actor or static mesh can become a foliage object in Unreal Engine. How do you do that? Click on foliage and then you can select an actor, which can be almost anything, or a static mesh, which is an art asset in Unreal. So let's go with this one. Let's give it a fitting name and click save. So now when you click here, you can here look into the mesh. Sometimes it's, it's hidden, so you have to open it up. And let's go into your content drawer, content starter content props. Let's say I want to pick something like this statue, for example. I have this statue selected. Go here back and click this use arrow. So right now, my mesh here is selected as static foliage. Now, let's start with a single one. So let's go down here. By the way, I have this one selected, little troubleshooting. And then it will have the shaders compiled. And once it is compiled, you can see there's a beautiful foliage asset right here. And I can quickly enable as many as I want. Or I can use also the paint tool. Let's change the brush size, the paint intensity, maybe a bit lower. And I can paint as many of these statues as I would like. Let's go really nuts. And now when I hit play, all the static meshes are right here. And right now I could walk through my statues, but I don't want that. So look for the collision preset. There was no collision, but I want to block anyone who comes over these objects. So, for example, now when I have the statues, my player, see, he bumps into it and he no longer goes through it, which is what I want with these objects. Now, of course, through plants, you can go through the plants right here, but you'll be blocked by these statues. If you want to change that somehow, go back to no collision. Let's paint this one here on the road. And then I can walk through these. And these ones are updated as well. So have a look at your different settings, your collisions and your offsets. And that way you can create very pretty easily foliage. In this part of the tutorial, we are going to talk about blueprints. Blueprints are in fact coding in visual scripting. It is a way to put logic to your game and make gameplay elements come alive. For this part of the tutorial, I already went back to maps and then the third person example map. So we are back inside of this level. Now, anything can be a blueprint because you can add blueprints to make a collection of different items and components or add logic to, for example, a character or an object or something you can't see. And let's select our character here, our third person character and click here to edit the blueprint. I like to dock this one next to here, so I can easily switch in between. Now, it is made of the viewport, construction script and event graph. The viewport is how you see this. The camera here is what the player sees. The arrows point forward, because that is the direction that our player is going. The character is made of a character mesh or a skeletal mesh right here. So when you make a model or download a model, you can replace it. So for example, I also can replace this with a female character, but I'm choosing the default one back. You can also move, rotate or scale the character so you can make him bigger or smaller and maybe you have to adjust your camera as you do so. Now, there are different components. For example, this is a character. So there is a character movement also in this. So also here. In your details you see the elements because this is a character the construction script is the things that will be enabled when you open up your level or your blueprint so in this case you can change certain materials but mostly you are inside of the event graph the viewport you set it up but mostly you are in the event graph and in our third person character example this already consists of input movement jumping touch and so on so you can have a look at how this is all set up, but you can also enter new logic inside of this. So for example, you can right click to get these nodes. This is pretty similar to the material graph. Left click to select 
are to drag around certain objects. Again, you can also hold control, move these wires around, alt click to undo a certain node, control Z to undo that one, and holding right mouse button while panning around, you can easily navigate around. Scrolling in and out also works. So here again, you have your components, you have functions, so you can make a certain logic and call upon it many multiple times. The macros is pretty similar to a function. It contains logic together, but mostly you start out with functions. In this tutorial, I will not go over macros, event dispatchers, and so on, but I want to show you variables as well. So let's say you want to show something on screen when the game starts. How you can do that is right click and look for an event. It's named event begin play. And when you click on this, you get this red box. And all the events and all the logic starts from an event. You can create events yourself, or you can create those ones from Unreal. And then it connects up to other nodes. And that way you get your code executed. So and you can drag off this, and then let's say print, print string. And this string is saying hello. And I can also change the words in here. For example, hello world. Now you always have to hit compile. And now in play, with its three dots, you can have it in the selected viewport, so you can look at it here. But I find it handy when it's in a new editor window. And now when I hit play, you have to see in the left upper screen. See? Hello world. And then it disappears. Or I can do something else. Hello you. And then again, hit play. See? You can plug anything into this, because this is hard-coded. And with a variable, we can use the variable multiple times and use it again. So in variables, you can hit the plus icon and let's name this one text. Now up here, you can change the type of input because a variable can have different inputs. You can also change this one here. And these are the most common ones. Now almost anything can be a variable inside of your game, but the most common ones are Boolean, so true or false statements to determine logic and conditions. An integer is a whole number. Float is a decibel number. And a string is a piece of text. Now, the other ones, like vectors to decide a certain spot in your world are also used. Anything can be used, but those are the most common ones. And this is a piece of text, so I choose string. And then I hit compile. And now I can add a value here. So, for example, this is a variable and I hit compile and I can drag this in and then I can set or get my text. Setting the text can change inside of my game and getting the text is getting the text that is currently inside of the value right here. And then I can connect this one up and now when I hit compile and play I will see the text this is a variable and that is here inside. By the way, the simulating I can also see, and now I hit stop, then it's not longer simulating. So what we can also do, instead of event begin play, I can click this and delete, is right click and get an input action. For example, E and then keyboard, I already see this here. So I can have input, and when this is pressed, then my variable will show. So now when I hit play, now I hit the E key, and I can hit it multiple times. You see it on the left side, I have many strings printing at the same time. That's the power of variables. And I can use these variables anywhere that I would like. Now we will use blueprints to add mechanics to our character. I have my character selected and I look for the walk speed. Right now, the maximum walk speed is 600. So this is the default value. When my character walks around, this is the speed of 600. So inside of our blueprint again, I already deleted the previous example, but what, what we can do is look here at our components and then select the character movement and drag it into our blueprint right here, our editor, our event graph. So I have reference to this character movement and of this character movement, I can drag off a pin and then I can set max walk speed. So I can change the walk speed. Now, at standard, this is set to 600. Now, I told you before, we need a red box 
to get this moving. So let's say the left shift key will make my character sprint because we will make our character faster. So when it is pressed, let's set the maximum walk speed, let's say 5,000. Now this is way too much, but when testing things out, I like to exaggerate the numbers because then I really see the change. And when it is released, we set back to the default walking speed. So Control W to copy this over. Also get a reference to the character movement and set the walk speed back to 600 when this is released. Now I hit compile, play. I'm walking around normally, see the speed. And now when I hold the shift key, see, I'm sprinting really fast. So I changed the logic of my character movement. Now, of course, when I tested this out, let's set it to a speed of 1200. So when he's sprinting, he's getting double the value of our walking speed. So right now, again, I test this out. Okay, good. Now I hold the shift key and he is sprinting and this looks way better already. Now there is a better way to do this because I have my left shift key here. What I can go is go to edit, project settings and under engine you find input. Now you have action mappings and access mappings. Now right here is set action mappings are for key presses and releases, which is what we do here. And access mappings allows for input to have a continuous range. So I hit this plus icon and let's name this sprint. And underneath of sprint, I can select the key. Let's say it for the keyboard. Or I can also type this in the left shift. And let's say you want to want to do this for the right shift. You add another one and then type in the right shift. But these are too many options. So again, hit the keyboard and then right shift. Okay. Now, what you can also do is, let's say, this is made for a computer, but you can also hit the plus icon and select any of these other ones. So, for example, a gamepad. And then you can add a thumbstick or anything, and all the input goes right here. So I can have many more than just this node. Okay, I will delete this one. So I both have the shift keys, the left and the right one. Okay. What you can then do is right-click. And now when I look for Sprint, you can see it is an action event. It is the same logic as the rest now, but I have the official bindings in the engine input. Now, another thing you can do is select the code and hit C on your keyboard to create a comment. And let's name this Sprinting. We do this because it's creating our code a bit more neat. Otherwise you have spaghetti code and many nodes going around. I don't know which one what is what. So right now I can see, ah, this is jumping. Okay, great, jumping. And I scroll out and I see, okay, this is the logic for sprinting and it's, well, it's more neat. So compile, play, test this out again if this works. I hold shift key, okay, this works. I hold my right shift key and this also works. So this is how you can enable with input, commenting, and setting up with the character movement. The third person character that we just edited was already a blueprint made by Unreal, but you can create blueprints of your own. Let's go to the content drawer, control space to open that one up. Right here they made the following content, third person BP. BP is for blueprint, so you recognize the blueprint, and in blueprints there is a folder for that. This is what we just made in, but you can also right click and create a blueprint class of your own. And you can choose if it is an actor, this can be anything, anything here can be a blueprint. Or a character is what we just had. You can also use pawns, for example, AIs, NPCs. But there are, here is also AI. And for this example, we will use an actor. And let's start simply with a couch. Now, if you just need a couch, you can just go to the props and drag the static mesh in. But we will get some logic for this as well. So double click to open this one. I like to dock it here. And we're going to go to add and then we need a static mesh and let's name this one couch and right here in the details i can look for the static mesh and look from the couch for my starter content and here's the couch already okay great we can add other components let's say we need a text render and we can name this text or something like that now you can change the variable name 
but the name of the text that the player will see is here underneath of text. So let's say sit down or something like that. You can also use these ones to drag them around, scale this one up. You can also use Alt and just have a look around. You can see a blueprint is made of, of multiple components. So this can be a blueprint, but we can also add logic. So when I have my couch selected, let's also click on add and look for box. So if they come near my couch and they see this box, then something can happen. First of all, this is way too tiny. So our player needs to overlap with this. What you can do is scale this box up so when our player is here is inside of this box then something happens and this can be anything make it a bit more like this so have the box selected and then when you come down you see here different events remember event from the previous blueprint something happens from that on components begin overlap when the player overlaps with this box by the way inside of the game the box is not visible just for editing purposes here first click compile and then on component begin overlap, I click plus, and now I go in the event graph of our blueprint that we just made, of our actor. And let's say when he overlaps, let's print a message, print string, and let's say relax in this couch, for example. Hit compile. Right now, the content drawer, let's dock this in the layout for now. I can drag this couch in. But I can do this as many times as I would like. So this is the power of blueprint classes. So now when I hit play, I can walk to any of these couches and you can see the text relax in this couch in the upper left screen. And it also appears on any couch. So the logic of this actor blueprint is applied. Also make sure you really test out the logic of your blueprint as well and different errors that can occur. So right now there's an error. I can walk through this couch and uh, as I tried lately I cannot do that in real life. So a solution for that is when you go to your couch, let's go to the viewport, select the static mesh. You can look here for the static mesh and click on the magnifying glass and then I can brass to the static mesh of this and then I see collision because right now there are no collisions applied and I can add a box simplified collision. Right now this is okay. But I can also use the WER keys to edit this collision. I hit save and back to the couch. In details, I can look for the collision. And right now it is set to block or you can use no collision at all. This is fine for me. So now when I go back to play, okay, right now it works. I am blocked. I can no longer go through this. And I get many uh, messages that I need to relax in this couch, so I will do that after this tutorial. With everything we learned so far, we can actually create a game, because that's why we're here, to create a game. So let's create a little platformer game. What I like to do first is delete these, these walls right here, and let's create a little platformer game. By the way, these boxes here, these are invisible inside of my game and they are a bit annoying to create a level right now. So I hit the G key on my keyboard to put them away or G to bring them back if you need them. And let's get rid of these elements that I don't need anymore. Now I want to create the effect that if my player goes out of the level, it has to restart the level. Right now in Unreal, this just bugs out. So we need to fix this. Simple way to do this is with go to create and then create a box trigger. Now this box trigger is hidden because we have to hit G again to see it because this is not visible inside of my world. You can also scale this up a bit. Let's put it right in front of him right here just to test this one out. And look at it from different perspectives. Okay, so this player is right in front of it. So this is good for testing purposes. Let's click here on the trigger box, F2 to rename it and let's name this die box. I know, very gruesome the die box. Having this die box selected, we can go to blueprints and open our level blueprint. The level blueprint is not a certain blueprint class like we just created, but we can create logic for the entire level that we're in. And this is pretty neat if we want to restart our level when our player falls off the edge right here. 
So let's do it again. Go to Blueprints and open Level Blueprint. So still having our box selected, I can go to Level Blueprint and then right click. And now I can get a reference to this die box. Click here, Add Event, Collision, and add on Actor Begin Overlap. So when I overlap with this box, something needs to happen. So drag out and then open Level. You can type in the name or the object reference. So, the level we are in is a third-person example map. Now, if you don't like this name, you can go to your content drawer, find the folder, and here you can click F2 and rename this to anything you would like for your level. For this tutorial's sake, I will just keep it as is. And when my player falls, it restarts back inside of this level again. Compile, and let's hit play. So, right now I'm here, and you see, now well, I'm back in my level. Again, you can see this resets the level. And we are going to drag this box here underneath our platform, big enough so when he falls out, then he's back there. Okay, let's also create a platform, Alt Drag, where he needs to go to. Let's make this a bit smaller to make our game a bit harder. And we will create platforms to reach him there. But we will scale our box out. So get our die box. Now, if you can't click it, you can just type it in right here. I like to click it away so I don't miss it. And then we need to scale this up. You can also hit this icon here and you can drag in any number you would like. Let's make this really big, let's say 50 times and then move it into place. Okay, so I went ahead and I did this. I scaled this up, moving out really far and you have to look at this from certain angles. So now I am sure it is covering the entire ring where he can jump off and fall down. But there is another thing we don't want it this high because our player will always keep reloading his level. So what I can do is having my box selected and go to perspective and let's say we look at it from the left. Now I can click here to move my object and then a little below my platform. So this is the line where if he jumps out then the level restarts. So now I click save and I go back here inside of left back to perspective. I can click on my player, hit F to zoom back. I also change the camera speed for this. So right now, hit play and try to jump off and see what happens. Okay, he restarts. I will try this from multiple sides. Let's start here. Okay, and we restart. And this is great for testing out. So our player always restarts our level and this happens anywhere if we fall off the platform. In order to reach our endpoint in our game and to make our game more interesting, we need to create platforms and moving platforms. These moving platforms, those are blueprints. So in our blueprint folder, we can right click and create a blueprint class. It's an actor. Let's name this one platform BP. BP for blueprint and then open it up. And then let's add a component. And this time let's add a cube. Because a cube, when you scale it down, it can become a little platform and let's also change the x and y axes okay this should be good then compile now it is not finished yet but i can already drag this one inside of my game so get a platform here and make sure it's about the same level as this maybe a bit higher that's okay and drag it in front of our player so it has to jump on side of this platform Okay, we can still work on our platform because right now, when I hit play, this is just a platform, but he can already get closer. Now, let's create this into a moving platform. How we do that? Now, go to the event graph. We don't need those two nodes, but we are going to create event begin play. Because when the game begins playing, then I want this to be moving. We want it to be moving over time, not instantly, like jump, click, Jump. He needs to be moving from left to right. So, to do that, we are going to drag off and create a timeline. Give it a name if you like. Double click on the timeline to open up a timeline. And we're going to add a vector track. Now, if you look closely here, you see these arrows right here. Those are on the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So, when I press G again, you can see that this is in the Y direction here in the green arrow. We want it to move in there and back. So this is in the y direction. We don't need it going up, 
you don't need to going forward. Those are also possibilities, but in my game I want to go left and right here. G again to hide all the stuff I don't need to see anymore. So it's a vector track. You can create a name for the track if you like. Oh, it's already in use, so I create another one. Let's say moving for example. I lock the X and I lock the Z axis because I only need the Y one. Then I shift click here on the style to create two nodes. Select the first one. This starts at time zero, enter with a value of zero and enter. The second one, let's say I want this to be looping over three seconds and let's have it at a value of 270, for example. You can also scale it up to fit inside of your screen. You can also edit these values later. Hit compile and I can close the timeline or reopen it whenever I would like. Now, let's get our cube and then set the relative location. Not get, but set. So we go from update into this wire and from moving into the new location. By the way, always try to avoid crossing wires if you can. So right now, this timeline is updating our location over time and it's moving in this location. Now, when I hit compile and play, you see this moving, but it stops. It also needs to go in the opposite direction. So to do that, we create a variable. This variable, let's name this, is looped, for example. Hit compile. And we want this to be looped in the opposite direction. So enable this one. By the way, if I drag this out, I get options get or set. Now what you can also do is hold control to get it together or hold the alt key to get the set. We need a condition for this. So that is with a branch. You can right click and type branch or hold B and click. The condition for this branch is, is this looped? And if it is looped, so true, then we want to reverse the motion and set this to not true. Or if this is turning, we want it to be looped back in a normal one. So we are going to plug this one into reverse and the other one into play. So let's do that now. So this one in the reverse pin, this one into the play pin once more. Now this looks like spaghetti code already, so double click, create rewiring nodes, also one here maybe, double click on this one. Okay, let's organize this a bit, same down here, and this one here. Okay, that's already much better. Now we get a little error. Our platform is standing still. Why is he doing that? Because right now it is doing this at the same time. So what we need to do is delay this for the duration of the platform that is moving. If you don't remember, select this node, it was over three seconds. So what we can do now in the event graph is right click and add a delay node and delay this for a duration of three seconds. We can type this in or create a variable for this, whatever you like, and then execute this one. So right now our platform is moving and it is moving back. And if it's moving back, yeah, okay, great, it is working. So once again, this is a lot to take in. What we did, event begin play. So when our level begins to play, it is moving over a period of three seconds with a value of 750, the distance. So if you wanted to move shorter, you can decrease or increase if you want to move it farther. Then we got our cube, which was our platform right here. You can also use a static mesh if you create one. And then we set the location. So. The location here it is in the y-axis we move it over the timeline location for this cube then we delay it for three seconds to do the opposite motion because it's the duration of our cube if we set it to four seconds it will pause for a second and then move back so first of all is it checking it is it looping yes it is looping so we have to turn it off and then we do the reverse motion we go over our logic again but we have to set it back and then we have to do the first one again. So the first one is going from left to right. The reverse is from right to left. And it's always looping over these conditions. 
Now, that is basically how you can create moving platforms. The fun thing with this is, I can copy this over. So, when I hold Alt key, and I drag this one out, let's also move this one a bit closer, so we don't have to make too many platforms. And let's drag our player a bit closer. Okay, great. What we can also do is just create a normal platform, so they don't all have to move. You can just create whatever you would like. So to create a cube, we go to Create, Shape, Cube. Okay, nice. Let's make a cube right here, for example. Look at it from different perspectives, because if you look at it like this, it is on the same level, it looks like, but just move it down. Now, another one is just to line it up like this. Or you can look at different perspectives, for example, like this. Or quickly do it like this. So you see, okay, this is almost the same. Scale it up a bit. Scale it down if you need to. And then move it into position, let's say here in the middle or something. Okay, this looks great. So let's see if I can beat my own game, because we have to test and maybe debug. And jump on the platform, jump here, jump here, and reach the end. And now I should do an action when I reach the end of my level. Make sure if I can die again. Okay, <laughs> great. So now we have some basic gameplay. We have moving platforms, so we have a destination that we need to reach. But what we need to do now is when he reaches this platform here, he won the game, we need to create a win menu, then he can play the game again, quit, or go to the next level, and create a sound and some particle effects to celebrate our victory. So, first thing I like to do is create this space here for testing purposes, and then drag it on over here. So, once again, we do something similar that we did before. Go here to create a box trigger for this. G to see this one again. Let's make it a bit bigger so we can really collide with this one. Look at it from different perspectives. Put it in front of our player for testing purposes right now. Okay, good. Let's click here. F2. Let's name this our win box. So when he wins, the box can be activated. Now, let's create a reference. Go to Blueprint, have this one selected by the way, and open level Blueprint. We already had our die box in here, but we right now have our win box selected. So below here, right click, add event for this trigger box, collision, on actor, begin overlap. And this is our win box right here. What we want to have happened, let's first try out with the particle effect. So, drag on here, or let's start with the other actor. Cast to to third person character, because this is our third person character, and he is the one colliding with the box. So we don't need other things colliding, only if this one collides with this. Then, drag off a particle effect, and it's called here an emitter. I want to spawn this emitter at the location. And the location is the location of the third person character. So. Let's here set get uh, location and get the actor location right here. And the actor location is connected here to our actor. Once more, it's this one. And then we can choose an emitter. And let's choose for an explosion. That looks cool, right? Compile, play. Let's test this out. Okay, so when I go in the box, I create this effect. Another thing we can do, something cool, is maybe play a sound. So, type in, play sound, add location, and let's create one of these. Maybe this is cooler. Yeah, it is cooler. So, create a sound. Now play. Okay, so, <laughs> maybe it's a bit too much, but it's cool when our player wins, we get this effect, and then we get our winning screen. So, for our winning screen, let's go back here to the content drawer and let's create a new folder for this. Right click, folder, UI, user interface, open it up, right click, and here in user interface, let's create a widget blueprint. Click on this one and let's name this one our win screen. Open this one up, give it a fitting screen here. Now, right here, you see common objects that you can put on side of your screen. 
Here you see the canvas, the things that go inside of my screen. Right here are animations, so you can make your screen a bit nicer and the details that you can also alter. Right again, compile button like always. Let's drag in a button and uh, let's say size to content because then it will take the shape of the text that I put in. Uh, but let's first put in text. So look for text and you can drag the text in here. Select the button and size to content. Again, pick this text and let's make the text a bit bigger. Okay, nice. Let's also here, you can change the font, the size, how it's looking. All of this you can change and tweak as you like. Now, let's look here at the text. The text here is text block. Let's name this next level. Enter. Once again here, grab the button. We can also uh, rename this by going F2 and then say, for example, play again. And then we need to anchor this to the middle of the screen. So when our player has different screen sizes, it is all anchored to that screen. Okay, so we have our play again button. Then let's control W to duplicate this one. And let's put this here. But let's click on this text and then change the text. And then ask the player to play again, question mark. And once again, grab this button, control W. And also give him the option to quit the game. By the way, I'm doing this uh, really fast. So what you can do is take your time. You can also use the position on X and Y axis here. So you can really tweak this right in the middle and make it perfect as you need to. So you can also change the names of these buttons. Play again here, F2 and quit. Okay, compile this one. Now we need something to happen when the player clicks on a button. So make sure you have your button clicked, not your text, but your button. And right down here below, we have more events on clicked. So when a player clicks next level, we drag out and then say open level. You can do it by name or object reference. So the next level. So in our content, third person blueprints, maps, I named mine material map. This is the map we made to show our foliage and landscape tutorial and materials. But maybe you have a different name. I chose this name and it's a bad name, but it will work. Okay, then you can go back to the designer tab, click the play again button. Again, event on clicked and choose open level. But this time we choose the current level, which is this one, the third person example map. And when our player here in designer, it's the quit button. So make sure you have your text, but your button selected on clicked. There's a function for that quit game. Hit compile. And now when I hit play, you will see nothing happens yet. Except for these two cool things that I did before. So what I do is go back to the event graph right here of our level blueprint. If you forget what that was, it is here in blueprints and then open level blueprint. We go here and drag off create widget and the widget is our windscreen and then we have to show this on our screen so add to viewport also make sure this return value is connected to target so when I play again you can see this is shown on, on the screen but the problem right here I don't see a mouse cursor and I can still play around we don't want this to happen so what also needs to happen is that we pass our game. So set game passed and pass to true. So our game is passed and we want to show our mouse cursor. For that, right click and then choose get player controller. Because those are the controls like, for example, having your mouse click. And then drag off this pin and then show mouse cursor and then set show mouse cursor and then make sure it's true hit compile and play and right now 
those buttons will work. For example, I can play again, but my effects are gone. So one little adjustment before we do this is add a little delay, lo delay note so our effects can take place. Delay. It automatically connect these. Maybe you have to connect these. And let's choose a duration of half a second. Compile, play. Hey, this worked. So I can choose play again. I can choose to quit. So just quit my game. I can also click and then go to the next level. And you can see, hey, this level, we still recognize it. It is opened. One little thing we have to do, because right now our game is very easy to win because our box is right in front. We have to take our box. If I can select it, I will go here. And then drag this over to the side we want it to be winning on. Then scale it up. Make sure it is covering all areas our player can jump on. Now, this one doesn't really matter. And then also look from the side here. Okay, this should be perfect. So let's try out our game, see if we can beat our own game. For testing purposes, we always have to do this. <laughs> this was pretty close already. And then let's get to that platform also. Okay, good. And boom. Nice. Then we go to next level. Play again or quit. Let's try next level. And this all looks fine. So we finally created our first game with a basic game logic. Okay hey guys, congratulations on completing this tutorial. But before you close off, let me show you one more thing you have to do before creating your own games. First of all, I want to tell you that this was a lot of new information to take in. Make sure you rewatch certain parts of this video when you need to. And in the future, if you want to create your own games and learn more, I would suggest you also go to Unreal Engine official website, go to learn, sign in to the learning portal with your own account, and then you can create any of these and start with these, however you want to learn. You maybe want to learn more about lighting, blueprints, becoming an environment artist or anything you would like. And you can go into game development, film TV, or sign into the learning portal and learn more. Another cool thing you can do is maybe create your own assets. For that, I would suggest you go to Blender. It is also completely free, it is an open source, and you can create models and animations that you can then put inside of Unreal Engine, for example. If you want to learn more from me, watch my YouTube channel, make sure you are subscribed, and in my videos, I'll regularly update new videos, and I also have playlists for Unreal Engine blueprints, Unreal Engine tips, or even for Blender, I have Blender modeling tips, and I will also create a big beginner course on Blender, just like I did here for Unreal Engine. Then I also want to say, make sure you subscribe to the channel and like the video. This way my channel can grow and you can show support. And that way I can keep creating videos just like this one for free. Then also make sure you start out with simple games or simple projects and then make more and more complicated games as you go. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Leave a comment if you would like to. And then I will say, see you in the next video. Have a great day.